There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, a boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, chromium, lithium, beryllium, and barium. Welcome to the summary video of the electrochemistry and battery chapter. In this video, I'm going to quickly go over all the dot points in a quite brief and concise manner. If you want to get a better understanding, I would recommend to watch the actual videos themselves. It's just a summary video. And so what I'll do, I'll go for each dot point. And the numbers which are below it are always um, corresponding to the actual video. So this here is covered in video number one. So first is explain the displacement of metals from solution in terms of their transfer of electrons. So what we have here is we have zinc and copper ions. Zinc will actually lose two electrons and become two plus and move into solution. And those two electrons will then move to one of the copper and the copper two plus become elemental copper. So here we have zinc, it's gone to zinc 2 plus and it has lost two electrons and those electrons become transferred to copper 2 plus and the copper 2 plus becomes elemental copper and it moves from solution onto the actual um, metal and displaced zinc. That was number one and that's how you explain, that's how transfer of electrons makes that happen. Second part was identify the relationship between displacement of metal ions in solution by other metals and the relative activity of metals. And that was covered in number two. The activity was all about taking and giving electrons. The more active metal was the one that gives electrons. The less active metal was the one that takes electrons. Here we just have a quick chart of activity. More reactive means more active. Less active means um, less reactive means less active. In this case, we have the one we had just now. We have zinc which is the metal form, and this will give electrons, so it's going to give electrons to copper because it is more active, so zinc is here, it's more active than copper, which is down here. Zinc will give because it's more active, and the less active one will take, so copper will take. So this will work, whereas if we have it the other way around, if copper is the metal, copper is less active, so copper is meant to give electrons, but the problem is because it's more active, less active, it only wants to take, so it's not going to give. And if it doesn't give, then copper, uh, zinc can't take, so zinc ions can't take those electrons. Zinc doesn't get those electrons. So even though this one worked, nothing happens in the other one. So we're just going to make sure we have the more active metal as our metal, and the less active metal as our ions. Third one was account for the changes in the oxidation state of species in terms of their loss or gain of electrons. That was covered in video number three. It says account, we need to know why oxidation reduction occurs. Um, so first of all, oxidation, that was the loss of electrons or the increase in oxidation number. Or reduction, that was the gain in electrons or the decrease in oxidation number. There are a couple of rules to determine what happens. So the rules for oxidation were there's if it's in its elemental state, in its neutral state, then it's always the oxidation number, oxidation state is always zero. In this case, zinc, because it's elemental, is zero. If it's an ion, its oxidation state is whatever the number on the ion is. So if it's zinc 2 plus, that oxidation state is 2 plus, which is an ion. If it's a compound, then it had, both of them have to equal up to zero. So in this case, zinc oxide has to equal up to zero. We know that um, oxygen is always minus 2, so if we want to have 0, it's minus 2 plus 2 equals to 0, so zinc is plus 2. That's how we could figure out the oxidation state of a compound, or of one of the atoms in a compound. When it comes to this, um, we know that zinc is elemental 0. The zinc goes from elemental 0 to zinc ion, which is 2 plus. So it has increased its oxidation number. Or other way of looking at it, it has lost these two electrons. So it has been oxidized. Whereas copper has gone from copper to plus to elemental copper. Elemental copper has, because elemental is zero. So it has reduced its oxidation state from two plus to zero. Or another way of looking at it, it's gained these two electrons. And that is reduced. So in this top point, we just need to be able to know what happens in terms of oxidation reduction. In this one, we have to describe and explain galvanic cells in terms of oxidation reduction. So beforehand, we just talked about metals. This time, we talk about galvanic cells. So galvanic cells, we have an anode. Anode is where oxidation occurs. We have a cathode. Cathode is where redu reduction occurs. And 
in this case, we have the anode being zinc. Zinc loses electrons. And those electrons move through the wire to copper, and copper gains those electrons. That was his describing part. Now we describe what happens. Explain means we need to explain why that happens. And that's because zinc is the more active metals, so more active metal loses electrons. Copper is the less active metal, less active metals gain electrons. So you have a flow from copper as zinc, which is more active, to copper, which is less active. And that's why this happens. We have this one here. Outline the construction of galvanic cells and trace the direction of electron flows. So there's two things we have to do. First, outline the construction, so what we need to construct to make it work. We need to connect our anode, which is where oxidation occurs, to the negative terminal. We need to connect our cathode, where reduction occurs, to the positive terminal. We need to connect both those anodes and cathodes. We need to connect them. We do that with a wire. We don't have to, but we often can put a voltmeter as well to measure the flow of electricity. We include the electrolyte solution, because that's very important to balance charge. And that's in this case is zinc sulfate for zinc and copper sulfate for copper. That's the solution. And then we also soak filter paper with salt to create that salt bridge. And that's also really important for balancing charge and finishing that circuit. So we need to construct each of these parts to make a galvanic cell. And the flow of electricity is always from anode to cathode. Right? That was, so in this case, we go from, from zinc to copper. That's the flow of electricity or the flow of electrons. The finer terms anode, cathode, electrode, and electrolyte describe galvanic cells. So if we have to define them, first of all, a galvanic cell is two connecting half cells that produce the flow of electricity. So each of these parts here is a half cell. If you combine them and if you connect them with a wire, then there are a galvanic cell because that produces electricity. So then we have to define electrode Electrode was a conducting plate of galvanic cells, so it's these metal plates. One will be an, an anode, one will be the cathode, we also, also have to define those. So the anode was the electrode where oxidation occurs, so the anode is where metal loses electrons. The cathode is the electrode where reduction occurs, so that means that the electrode gains electrons. And the electrolyte, that was the ear, in this case zinc sulfate and copper sulfate solution, and these just help balance charges. So these were the things we had to define in this dot point. Uh, here we have to perform a first investigation to identify the conditions under which a galvanic cell is produced. So these are the four things we did definitely have to have to have present for galvanic cells to function properly. We have to have the more active metal. The more active metal has to be on the anode. Because remember, the more active metal is supposed to lose electrons. And if the less active metal is at the anode, then nothing will be lost. So the more active metal has to be at the anode. The electrolyte solution has to be present, and the salt bridge has to be present. This helps us to balance charges. Without this, charges won't be balanced, and the whole circuit won't be complete. Also, we obviously have to make sure that the cathode and the anode have been connected. So if they're not connected, then we can't have a flow of electricity from anode to cathode. So these were the requirements for galvanic cells to work properly. Next is perform a first-hand investigation and gather first-hand data to measure difference in potential of different combinations of metals. So in this case, you would have had a different combination of metals, and you would have measured the electron flow or the voltage in labs. Now here we have a couple different ones. We have cathode as a copper, uh, copper as a cathode, and zinc as an anode. For that, you would have gotten a voltage of around about 1.1 volts. For silver as your cathode, and copper as your anode, you would have gotten a voltage of around about 0 0.46 volts. And for anode as your uh, iron as your anode and cathode as your copper, we've you gotten a voltage of around about 0 0.9 volts. In the way, I mean, this is what you would have done in a lab. You would have measured that in the lab with your voltmeter, but you can also calculate it as well. And the thing is, with this, this is your reduction potential table. For a bigger number to be produced, we want to have the cathode and the anode being as far away as possible from each other. So in this case, we've got the silver here and the copper here. They're really close together, which is why the value for the, this one is the smallest. We have copper here and our iron here. They're further apart, so that's why we produce even more electricity. But our copper is here and our zinc is here. They're the furthest apart, which is why the voltage is going to be the highest when it comes to that um, galvanic cell. 
Then we had this one, solve problems and analyze information to calculate the potential requirements of named electrochemical processes using the table of standard reduction potentials. This is the standard reduction potential table. And for, we're going to just do one calculate, calculation. We're going to have our anode be zinc and our cathode be copper. First, we write the half equations and then we calculate the voltage. So for the half equations, we just need to write what actually happens. So if anode is zinc, and then zinc loses electrons. So zinc goes from zinc elemental to zinc to plus. So it lost these two electrodes. That happens at the anode. The copper is the cathode, so it gains electrons. So here it's the iron that gains the two electrons to become copper elemental. The net equation is just overall what happens. And usually we just ignore these electrons to make that net equation. Zinc plus copper two ions goes into zinc two ions plus copper. That's your net equation. Now to calculate the actual potential, what we have to do is we have to look at the reduction potential and oxidation potential and add them two together. This table looks at the reduction potential. So we have to have the reduction part first. In this case, our copper is being reduced because it goes from two plus to zero. So we, all we do is look at that table, see what value we get for copper, which is 0 0.34. And then for um, zinc, because this table looks at reduction, but it's actually being oxidized. All we have to do is find zinc and then take that value and flip the sign. So it says minus 0 0.76. We'll flip the sign to plus. This is plus 706. And then from that, we can add them two together and we get a volts of 1.1 volts. And that's our calculation. Last is gather and present information on the structure and chemistry of dry cells and lead acid cells and evaluate it. So we have to choose one of the two. I've chosen the dry cell in this one. I have to compare it to one of the following and I've compared the dry cell, the button cell. And we have to compare it in terms of chemistry, costs and practicality impact on society and the environmental impact. So first I'll talk about the cost and practicality for both. So this is the dry cell. The dry cell is cheap to produce, but it has a relatively short half-life, which means it doesn't last, last for as long as other batteries might. Its impact on society, it's widely used, it's really important. These are the AA and AAA batteries. So these are extremely important when it comes to more or less anything. <clears throat> the impact on the environment, it's non-toxic but also non-recyclable. Overall, there's a small impact on, on the environment because it's not toxic, so we, it's not a problem if you throw it away. And it's, so that is your, your cost, practicality, impact on society, and impact on the environment from the dry cell. And for the, uh, for the button cell, especially your silver button cell, which is this one, we've got, it's expensive to produce because there's silver in it, but it has long shelf life. This is cost and practicality. Impact on society, it's important, especially for small appliances, so watches and everything else has have these button cells. And the impact on the environment is non-toxic, which means it doesn't have a massive impact on the environment either. And then we have to compare the chemistry as well. If the dry cell produces volts of 1.5, and your lead acid, your button cell produces volts of 1.6, so they're quite similar. This happens at your anode, this happens at your cathode, so these half equations are your half equations. I would remember half equations when it comes to this dot point. You might be asked to repeat them. I'm not going to go over them, um, but you should know your half equations for whichever one you choose. But I'm going to talk about the anode for the dry cell. Anode, we have zinc as our anode for the dry cell. And for our cathode, it's graphite rods. This is a graphite rod. And it has manganese dioxide paste. And its um, electrolyte is nitronium Ammonium chloride, sorry. And for the button cell, it's anode is zinc powder. Its cathode is silver oxide, which is here. And its paste is potassium hydroxide. So I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.